property back a year ago in uh, the Tipper Hill in Syracuse, a uh, 48 unit complex. It's our first large multifamily uh, we purchased. Um, that's been going well through COVID. Actually, we, we closed and COVID hit and it was kind of like uh, the eye opener that uh, stuff does hit the fan pretty quick when you, you buy your first property. Can't expect it, but something will. And we got COVID. So it was very interesting and learned a lot and uh, we worked through it, but it's been going great. And I think we, uh, we've done a lot better than we actually thought we could and uh, it's turned out great. So um, shortly after that, we decided to do more and uh, Jamie and myself known each other for a little while and uh, decided to kind of talk a little more about joining as a partnership. So there's the four of us that are working now, Jamie, Chris, and Gary, and myself. Uh, we're looking at for bigger and better properties here in upstate New York and uh, probably down in the South Lake, the Carolinas next after that. So it's a quick one on me for you guys. Awesome. Thanks, John. Uh, Gary, you're up. I just did what John just said. So yeah, I've been perfect. Doing, All right. Doing, uh, <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Uh, multifamily for a while. Uh, started selling off some of my duplexes uh, last year. So uh, trying to make way for, you know, bigger investments in the commercial properties. So um, we're storming, trying to get, uh, trying to get some deals. Uh, four of us have uh, gotten together and uh, we're just really starting to, you know, hit the road here and see what we can drum up as far as 2021 goes. Um, and uh, yeah, looking forward to a great year and some uh, some great uh, great opportunities hopefully come our way. Certainly, thanks, Gary. Uh, David. Yeah, uh, I started um, single family rentals about 1998. In and out, um, we purchased our first multifamily back in 2013. A small five unit with storage units and garages. <laughs> uh, we just closed on an 11 unit um, beginning of December. I'm working on a 99 unit. Um, I would flip some information to Gary. And then uh, also looking at a 19 and a 48. So hopefully be able to bring something to you guys. Great. Thanks, Dave. Really appreciate it. And uh, looking forward to seeing that stuff. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. Hi, uh, Chris. Uh, yeah, so my story is kind of similar to, to you, Jamie. Um, been doing this for a few years now. Um, I went into the two families, the four families started over in like the Tip Hill area, um, which is kind of a very, really popular for like the younger kids uh, coming out of college um, and then slowly kind of graduated to like the five units, the six units and then um, total. And right now we have 25 units um, and just kind of looking to get into some bigger stuff. So I met Jamie, um, I think two years ago or so, whatever it was when you started this group um, and uh, kind of had similar goals. So we teamed up with uh, us, John and Gary and looking to take down some bigger stuff. Awesome. Thanks for joining, buddy. Appreciate it. Uh, Dominic. Hey, so uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yes. Beautiful. Sounds good. Uh, so Dominic Manfredo, um, full-time. I'm actually chief executive officer of a senior housing company in New Hartford, New York. Um, but uh, instead of just making our company uh, get bigger uh, and grow, I'm also looking for my own personal portfolio. First thing I did was uh, five years ago, I house hacked my first duplex. Uh, nowadays, I realize that the uh, demand for duplexes in the smaller units, there's too much competition, prices are going up, cash flows down. I'm really looking into the bigger um, style units in the commercial end and uh, in the residential end. I was looking for 24 and above to get into my own personal uh, portfolio. I'm looking right now at a 68 unit and uh, another one that is 30 units. Um, all within our area. So I'm looking to partner up with uh, other people and network and see what everyone else is doing. Great, man. Thanks, Larry. Really appreciate you jumping. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, really appreciate you jumping on and sharing your experience and uh, hope we can help you out. That'd be Thanks. great. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Um, Jay, how you doing, bud? Hi, guys. Um, yeah, just like uh, Dominic, I started off by House Hack the Duplex, and that was about 15 years ago. Still have it, and now I'm just looking to get into bigger multifamily. Great, thanks, awesome man. Appreciate. It. Thanks for joining, uh, Stephen. Hi, uh, Steve Episcopo. Um, I am uh, relatively new at this. I have one uh, single-family home, but I have a six-unit apartment building under contract right now locally, and um, 
am just uh, looking to learn. It, it wasn't my plan. I wasn't, I didn't think I was qu uh, qualified enough for bigger mm. properties like that, but it just kind of mm. fell into my lap. So um, trying to make, trying to make that work and uh, realize that it seems a better path to go. So yeah, that's great. Amen. Yeah, totally. You got to start somewhere and it's great when they are, they, when they say, yeah, you're accepted. It's like, yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for jumping on. Uh, Stan. Yeah, I'm Stan Matus, and I guess I started investing in uh, duplexes, triplexes, and quads 15 years ago or more. And uh, just in the last few years, I've tried to migrate up to larger units. Uh, we got a 12 and a 11 unit um, last year, and but would like to migrate to larger complexes and um, excited to connect with you guys. Awesome. Thanks. Really appreciate you jumping on. Uh, I think the last one here, uh, Matthew. Hey, how's it going? Sorry. Um, yeah, so I actually bought my first San Francisco uh, single family home when I was 24, and I bought my first multi unit in San Francisco when I was 29. And now at 38, I just bought another property, but I am looking to syndicate uh, deals now. Awesome. Very cool. Awesome. Are you looking to syndicate in your area or just anywhere? Or? Uh, looking to syndicate out of state. Okay. And working with um, some mentors and trying to get our first deal funded this year. Awesome. Great, man. Thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. Uh, everybody, I appreciate jumping on. Uh, if you guys want to and you want to throw just your contact info in here, feel free. I uh, appreciate reaching out to people in any way, shape, or form. So Zoom, obviously, is the <laughs> preferred method at the moment, but it won't be forever. So uh, if you ever want to reach out to me and grab a drink or a coffee, whatever, lunch, um, by all means. Uh, hopefully, we'll, we will be able to do that <laughs> sooner than later. <laughs> But um, yeah, so uh, we started this group really as a is from two perspectives. We wanted to help educate people, but we also wanted to show people kind of what we are going through, um, what we are seeing, what are we underwriting, and why, and also to bring on people like John Fortes, who can kind of shed some light on the path he uh, he did to getting from IT consultant to now um, a successful syndicator. So I look forward to hearing his story and. And letting him share it with you guys, it's uh, it's inspirational to just talk with people who are just like us, who just started this, pushed hard, and you know we're able to grow a company and make something happen. So, uh, look forward to it. Um, trying to think if there's anything here. I think we got a few more minutes. He said he's going to jump on around 6:45, so I'm I expect him to pop in here any minute. But um, has anybody actually ever listened to? I'm sure he'll tell you this, but anybody ever listened to his podcast? He does have a podcast as well. <laughs> I actually have. Uh, I skimmed through. He's, and the one of the things I like about his podcast is that he's got like quick five minute, you know, intros and quick five minute um, um, audio clips, which are great because some there's so many podcasts now. They're some of them are way too long. You just can't, <laughs> you can't, you don't have enough time in the day to listen to them all. <laughs> so I definitely recommend that. I'll throw a, I'll throw a URL in here for you guys. But um, we've actually seen John and hung out with him when we were able to do events. <laughs> We actually caught up with him uh, down south. I can't remember where, where, where was the last time we saw him, John. Was it was it Dealmaker Live? Maybe it was Dealmaker Live. Yeah, Dallas. Yeah. Dallas. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, it was good talking with them. I know you guys hung out with them. I was busy networking and stuff, so I didn't really have an opportunity to chat with them. Um, but yeah, so he's he's definitely been able to grow. Um, I'll do a little introduction when he hops on, but you know, essentially, he's got 590 units right now. Um, I think he, I think he's either, I think he's either helped raise around 70 million with his investors. Um, so it's pretty impressive. It's, it's pretty cool to be able to see. Uh, so I look forward to uh, hearing from him and just kind of what his advice is. Uh, he's a family man. So I know a lot of us are trying to navigate the W2 life, the family and trying to do real estate all in one. Uh, so it can be kind of challenging to achieve all those goals. But uh, anybody have any questions? I mean, uh, from our perspective, our 24 unit, we've been very lucky and fortunate. Uh, we haven't really had any issues with COVID. In fact, I'll be there tomorrow to just bring some supplies to our contractors. But we've been pretty fortunate. We haven't had any issues with any kind of evictions or, or just dealing with the any kind of delinquency. So we've just been fortunate, crossing fingers. Hopefully it stays that way. Um, but overall, it's been pretty good. All right, looks like he's uh, jumping in. Sweet. Perfect timing. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 
John, I think I see John. you jumping in, bud. You're on mute, boss. She's trying to make it look good. Like he's logging <laughs> in. He's, he's got the suspense. <laughs> 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 oh, that's great. What's going on? How you guys doing? Hey, man. How you doing? Uh, how's it going? <laughs> Living a dream. How's everybody today? Happy New Year. Yeah, yeah for sure. Happy New Year. Thanks. I'm, I'm really good. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Right. Give me one second. I'm just going to put my phone on mute. Oh, sure. That's a good tip, actually. And mine will vibrate for I am good. All right. Um, hey, thanks for uh, jumping on. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, like myself, family man, I know it's tough trying to step away from the family at night. So thank you for jumping on and talking with us and just uh, sharing your story. Uh, so nah, no worries. No worries. It, it, I'm I'll be here right after this. I got to jump on another call for my 62 unit. So we have a uh, meeting once a month, but this is an early one because sometimes the 10th falls on different days, but they just want to have an early one this month. Yeah. It definitely seems like in this business, you uh, do a lot of night calls. <laughs> oh, well, it, it, what's funny about it is because if you really think about it, the way you get started is, it's almost like a night job because you're underwriting deals at night and then and you're sending emails out almost at night to be responded to in the morning so that when you're at your day job, you're only dealing with email communication and you don't have to go ahead and look at your underwriting or any other things that you need to do. I mean, Gary and John, they can tell you that, that when they were underwriting deals, it's a lot of weekends and nights visiting properties. And man, I mean, we talk about it. We, yeah. we talk about what we go through. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely is a, a hustle and a push to get to achieve those goals. Um, but uh, it's great to talk yeah. to other people. Who've but when you got to travel to other states, though, that's when it oh, gets pretty yeah. interesting. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me do a quick introduction for you and then I'll let you tell your story and then uh, share whatever it is in your wisdom. I really appreciate that. So, you know, currently John has uh, 590 units of commercial real estate. Uh, I believe it's worth, uh, is it 70 plus million? I think you said that that's out over now. That's uh, amazing. Uh, that he, he asset manages for his investors. Uh, John, along with his wife, Jen, and their two beautiful children, boy and a girl, a boxer and two cats reside in South Boston uh, in the South Shore of Massachusetts. I haven't been there. Sounds pretty nice. Might have to go hit you up one time. <laughs> <laughs> John Fortez is also known for uh, as a passive investor consultant, founded the Fortez Company, which partners with working professionals seeking to invest in diversified commercial multifamily funds uh, because they just don't have the desire or the time to, uh, to manage their own assets. So we all know what that's like. Um, I, I got to throw this out. There's a little fun fact about you that I did not know that uh, you are looking to actually to become, or you are an NCAA men's basketball official right now. And I think I've heard something about you want to do it in the NBA as well. Uh, half right, right? So <laughs> I, am a, <laughs> I am an NCAA basketball official at the division three level. My goal is to get to the division two and division one level. I don't have aspirations for the NBA, but if they came calling, their training was from phenomenal that really I would have to entertain it. Wow. That's amazing. Uh, I got to ask, um, what is it? Are you actually doing any officiating now or is it just, is it too challenging with COVID? Uh, right now, the division three has not even started. And the funny thing, I don't know, the, wor the world in the universe, you asked that. Mm -hmm. I just got the email for the meeting to see if we're going to have something in January and February uh, for division three. And um, that, that's where, that's all I know right now. I don't know where they're going with it. I don't know if they're having a season, but what it will be is a lot of teams did opt out. So that's how it looks right now. But the D one is happening at the D one level, just to give you an idea, they're testing almost like every day. Ah. And then they're being monitored as they walk into the, to the building. I also do high school locally here, but I opted out of that. Yeah. Okay. Well, I find it inspirational that on top of the family, on top of running this business, you still want it and, and are able to do stuff like that. So it's just uh, phenomenal. It just tips a lot to your, your worth ethic for sure. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about your story and uh, fill us in. Awesome. Thank you for having me guys. Um, Jamie, John, Gary. Hello. I know we have multiple conversations gary and john around a group text chain practically so i'm always asking you guys about your project and if you know if i could be a resource 
just ask, right? So the thing is in this business is you got to ask a lot of questions to get to where you want to go. And that's kind of how I came in because as a basketball official, I needed to free up time. Started reading uh, books and, and, and trying to explore the stock market, but I realized I needed more passive income. Real estate gave me passive income. At that time, I wasn't investing in anything other than my 401k. So I took what I knew about my own personal home, the value, we bought a foreclosed home, basically fit to model us, renovated and repaired a bunch of little things and little projects, you know, it's ongoing thing with, with the home and saw the value grow, the equity just shoot up. Um, it's just kind of, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't even press anything. Sorry. <laughs> They hear everything. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So what happened was um, I saw the value and I said, all right, I I'm listening to all these podcasts about real estate, reading books about real estate, and also reading books about the stock market. What I really do understand is real estate. It's I understand force appreciation. I understand appreciation. I understand equity. I understand real estate in general. So that's kind of how I got into it. Um, I, I started exploring bigger pockets, started asking questions there. Um, what I did do was I wanted to buy a, my first investment pro uh, property. Realized I am a safe investor. I like, you know, cash flow. So I bought a turnkey. Uh, if anybody doesn't know what a bar is, buy, rehab, um, rent, refinance, and repeat. You just keep doing the cycle. And I realized I'm just kind of like, do I want to do all that work? I didn't have the time for it. I'm working a, you know, IT job, uh, refereeing, and I noticed that my aspirations is starting to, to, to be where I want to go with the D1. So at the time, I'm not working college. I'm doing just high school, and I know that I got to go to all these tryouts and stuff. So real estate investing is kind of what made sense for me to free up my time to go ahead and pursue that. I have a supportive family that allows that. My wife, we talk about everything. We talk and pray about everything when we're starting to do investing. So the minute we we um, had under under contract, the minute we were about to go close our um, single family home, and I'm in Massachusetts, my single family home that I purchased, investment home, is in Florida. I'm cool with that. I have a local family in the area. They know the area. It's good. Um, tenants are good. It's, it's just, you know, it's, it's doing exactly what we underwrote it to do. Um, to this day right now, we are under, we are actually refinancing that because the rates are so insane. So if you have investment yeah. property, explore that option. So from there, I, um, I told my wife, that's the last one we're going to do. We're going to just go ahead and start looking at multifamilies. And I didn't realize I was going to go into big apartments and I just kind of was naive and just asked a lot of questions. I joined a lot of private Facebook groups. And my goal was, if Jamie asked a question in the group, my goal was to be the first one to answer and say, this is what I heard on a podcast. This is what I uh, read in a book. This is what I read on a blog. And, and, and I would share the link of the blog or whatever. And then if I was absolutely wrong, Gary would come in behind me and be like, no, that's not how you do it. But this, this, this. So I wasn't scared to put myself out there to get the information I needed because back then all my alerts were on right now. I have no alerts on. If you tag me in anything, I don't see it until I go on wow. because it's, I've built up such a, um, you know, I get tagged in things that I, I, I just can't afford to take away my time. I'm from to go ahead and focus on other things right now. So social media to me is kind of like on the back end. Back in the day, it was more on the front end where I used it as my resource to go ahead and ask questions because people, when they answer questions in those groups, you get almost instant responses depending on the size of the group or community. Mm. Um, so from there, I purchased some education, some multifamily education. I've never gotten a mentor, but I asked a lot of questions. So I feel like that's kind of my mentors when I'm whoever's answering the question. To now I do have a mentor with funds. Um, it it kind of naturally came. It, it's funny how that happens when you're asking a lot of questions. Um, but yeah, so I partnered on 62 units because I was part of a community when I purchased some multifamily courses. 
online courses, I, I, I champion them. If you can find a course to teach you anything from cooking to whatever, whatever you want to learn, I, I encourage it because it's only a couple hundred bucks when, you know, colleges are charging thousands. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> learn anything. Right? <laughs> so here we go. So um, shortly after that, I, I syndicated my first 41 unit. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry. We, per- we partnered up with a bunch of people on a 62 unit. That's the one that I'm, I have a call on after this. Hmm. And then um, that was a type of project that I would never put investors in. And even though I'm a little safe, I understand that I had a bunch of partners that, uh, that I went into this where we were supportive of the, of, of the type of potential. So it was a 62 in Johnson City, Tennessee for 1.2 million. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we put in about a million dollars of work into it. But that was through bridge loans where they're helping with the rehab process. <coughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. But the value of that project is going to be a $3.4 um, million dollar project. Wow. So, <coughs> excuse me. Sorry. Are you good? <clears throat> yeah, that's awesome. I mean, you don't see the uh, price point 62 million, uh, 62 doors at 1.2 million. That's tough. That's tough to find out for that price. But it's, it, but it's uh, extensive rehab. Yeah. We still haven't gotten any cash flow from it. That's why I would I would never put investors in it. Got it. <clears throat> yeah. So, with that said, the the returns are going to be explosive when they finally get there, but we haven't gotten there yet. Sure. Fast forward five months later, six months later, we are literally syndicating our first forty one unit, Chattanooga, mm-hmm. and then about a, I would say almost like a year after that, we offered another. 528 units in urban tennis uh, urban texas wow it's a big one so in the middle of covid before we even held the property the 41 unit for about a year someone else came to us and said hey we want to buy it for you we said we can't sell it to you until after uh, until february so if you want to meet us at this price and wait till february and if you're probably syndicating you're probably going to say give me the longest more time yeah absolutely instead of 60 days right yeah, I'll, I'll wait. Right. So they came to us in October. We told them to wait until they came to us in November. We told them uh, if they could wait till um, no, it was October. I'm right. And uh, if they could wait till uh, February, we'd be happy to uh, sell at that price. So we we came on the con- on the contract. We put that in. The, and then um, February, March, April, May, May, we finally exited from that at a one point five multiplier. And. <clears throat> when you have an asset that's kicking off like 9% cash on cash return, if you know you're going to exit in five years uh, and that's the goal of what you told your investors, it, it's not like we told them we're going to buy and hold forever. Mm-hmm. So if we're, if we're kicking it, if we're keeping it for five years, the value is if we're getting half of our returns in 15 months of holding, mm. There's no, it doesn't make sense. And, and this is when you're talking to other, other investors, it doesn't make sense to hold it for another four years, four years, just for that half, just for that half. Right. Yeah. yeah. So if, if that's what you promised your investors, you got to make the right decision for your investors. And that was the right decision for our investors. And the reason why people always ask why wait until a year, if you don't, you get with short-term capital gains. And now when I'm giving Jamie his money back, Jamie will never invest with me again because, Hey, you're going to sell in less than a year and and I'm going to get taxed the hell out of it. So that's kind of one of those things where, where you want to um, know why you're doing things and, and why a year or um, when to sell. So if that's your eg- exit strategy, you got to know when to sell and if it makes sense for your investors. So it's wow, great. Uh, I can't, I mean, that's amazing that you went from the size and then jumped into that 500. That's a, uh, that's a pretty, you can tell us a little bit about how that all fell, uh, fell together. Yeah. So like conferences, going to conferences, going to uh, networking events and, and, and constantly having conversations. So things like this never stop happening for me. I'm always trying to be around a lot of people. I'm always trying to share experiences. I'm always trying to talk multifamily. And John will, will, will tell you straight at a conference, we came back from dinner one night and we, it was probably like 10 o'clock when we got back from dinner right after the conference. And we stayed in the lobby talking just pure multifamily till 1230 at night. It was to the point where I knew I was 
my feet were hurt. And it was the only reason why I was like, John, I got, I got to go get out of these shoes. I probably would have went and changed out of those shoes if my room wasn't so far and came right back. But yeah, it was one of those situations. Yep. Yeah. I, uh, those events are great. Uh, but you're absolutely right. They usually are going to have long, long days. You're, you're going to pretty much be up really early <laughs> and then you're going mean, to socialize. I feel like being around, around people and, you know, you like talking about money and real estate and Life, potential yeah. returns and opportunities. I mean, yeah. It fits, right? It, 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 it's a little bit uncomfortable at the beginning talking about, you know, hey, you know, you got 100,000. You might want to explore the opportunity of this, op, you know, this investment, but it never comes off like that in the beginning. Sure. Oh, you got 100,000. Yeah, hey, I got something for you. <laughs> right. It sounds like that in the beginning. So you, you got to have those conversations to know, how to have those conversations later. But I do have a presentation. Sure. If you want me to go ahead and- Go for you know, it. Yeah, you should be able to share your screen. <clears throat> awesome. So um, right now what I'm focused on is, is funds. And I think it's a cleaner process. So I'll use Gary and John as an example because this is such an awesome meetup. And I, I wanna actually, you know, tell you guys, I'm, I'm grateful that you guys are actually here because learning something about how you can actually change the, the trajectory of your family's just legacy starts with meetings like this. I don't know why this keeps going off. But um, <laughs> yeah, so this is my company. It's my marketing arm from this. So this is what I use to run my podcast and webinars and anything I need to put out there for exposure, I threw it through the Fortes company. Now, this is basically what we'll be talking about. We'll be talking about the team, the type of projects we do, our services, and, and not that I'm trying to sell you guys something. It's just, this is what we do on, on this end. And then the real estate fund, I'm gonna educate you guys on syndications and real estate funds. They're essentially the same, but there's a little bit of difference. A syndication, you're gonna be able to go ahead and do one deal at a time. We're gonna syndicate this, um, 38 unit and that's it on a fund we're gonna raise three million and go buy 438 units if that makes sense yeah totally. <clears throat> so obviously you guys <laughs> i don't need to put that up but this is just basically a, a slide just to let you guys know the disclaimers of, of i'm not trying to sell you guys anything this is not a securities sales pitch or a syndication but you'll notice a lot of these on even on prospectus you'll see this type of a disclaimer on any offering you might see going in, into a deal. Uh, it's just little things that, that, that keep you going. So Warren Buffett's famous quote, you know, if you don't make money in your sleep, you know, you'll keep working until you die. But I'm sure we've seen this all over Instagram, social media, Facebook, whatever you guys use, whatever platform you use, you've seen this thousands and thousands of times, but it, it's so true. So this is my company timeline. So in 2008, that's when I basically started and launched. Um, that's when I bought my first, uh, uh, what's it called? Um, single family home in February. And then it, the Buffalo Ridge came in September. And then the following, um, the following year came the Chattanooga. I got to fix that. And then, yeah, that same year in 2019, Chattanooga and Vista Ridge happened. So I got to fix that. I didn't catch that earlier, but yeah, now that I'm thinking through it, talking through it, I'm glad I had this. Uh, <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> glad to yeah. help. <laughs> and, and now um, that's what I'll be working on going forward is the, the, the fund. So the goal is to basically source the capital and be able to go ahead and diversify e each investor's capital by making multiple purchases on the one fund. And a lot of companies are rolling that out and, and starting to do that with, um, I just had a call with one of my, one of my good friends, Dylan, he just wrote out a fund for mobile home parks. You'll see this, ha this happens is so common in the hedge fund game that, excuse me, they start funds and then they go ahead and pitch institutional uh, investors who, who basically they start like these one $500 million funds and they'll go and get hundred million or 50 million from a uh, let's say a pension fund that's looking to diversify so they'll just throw capital at their funds and hoping that they go make a profit for them 
So it's a very common investment style. It's now starting to become more explosive in the real estate world. Um, even big companies that I know that just made an announcement, I got an email recently that they're starting to roll out a fund because they're coming across, uh, when you're coming across a lot of opportunities, <clears throat> And especially during a, a time like right now where you think that there's going to be a lot of, let's say, good opportunities that you can take advantage of. If you have the capital, you can go ahead and jump on those opportunities uh -huh. yeah. if, if you know what you're doing almost immediately because you have the fund already as opposed to syndicating where you got to go ahead and you know, raise the capital while you have it in contract. It's, it's, it's good if you know a lot of people that, like, if you have a good, a good network, you could go ahead and start raising for a fund because if that's who you're intended, I wouldn't say you start immediately, but you know what I mean? You start a fund, right. raise the money once, and then go and do what you do. So I think it's a no brainer. And I thought um, this should have been happening years ago. Uh, so this is just another Robert Kiyosaki. I think we're all familiar with him, but I don't want to uh, focus on that. But here's, here's, um, here's how you guys started. So you want to reach your goals. This is why everybody starts. I, my, my, go my reason was I needed time. I needed to be, as a basketball official, what happens is if I don't have availability, when they assign me a game, they take away the game and it goes to another person. Mm -hmm. As an official, I am an independent contractor. The, on, the NBA is the only um, referees that have a union and they get hired and they're on the staff. So whatever you're, if you get two games that year, you know, you get two games that year, that's it. But you're hired at a, at a salary. So MB, as far as high school and college, you're an independent contractor and you're working game by game. So having time to be available was my you know my my why so there's a bunch of different whys if you know if you're looking for, to replace your income just preserve your wealth and grow your your savings or just reach some financial goals that we each have a why so this is basically who i um as my at my company this is what i use my 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 tax guy my accountant guy um, my wife went to school with him. He's very knowledgeable. I was actually on the phone with him earlier today about LLCs and, and different things and fund call and, and fund um, conversations about the fund too. So he is basically my go-to when I need to ask any tax things. I don't try to read books about taxes and then go ahead and study the tax. I, I already done it. I pay him to do it. I pay him to do my taxes. I, I trust him and that's basically everybody should have that team member. Um, as far as cost segregation, we got companies that you use for them, and then also attorneys that draw up contracts. There's several that I've already networked with. The fact that I have a podcast, I get to go ahead and interview people and then just build relationships and, and see if I want to participate in, in working with them in future things. As far as, for instance, a syndication attorney, when I, you know, whoever's drawing up contracts, legal documents for those type of stuff. I like to ask a lot of questions. So podcast was just natural for me to kind of have to go ahead and ask a bunch of questions. Now, this is the benefits of it. it my model is it's beating inflation 1% 1, 1 at a time. And that's basically all I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to create cash flow, but not lose the value of my, my savings. So whatever you have in your 401k, if you're going to use a self-directed IRA to invest with, um, if you're going to use your, a pile of savings and inheritance, whatever, however, home equity, I don't know how you, you invest, but there's a bunch of reasons. And one of the big, well, this is just for the reasons how real estate basically pays you, pays you through appreciation, cash flow, tax benefits, loan pay down, um, which is not listed here and the hedge against inflation, which is the wealth preservation. Sorry, the slide is not, I'll fix that. But basically, that's five ways real estate pays you. And that's why I like real estate. Uh, when you understand that philosophy where appreciation is usually historically 6% a year, not every year, an average, um, inflation eats at your capital at about 2% a year. 
I like, I like, I don't buy straight on appreciation either though. I'm buying mainly on cash flow. And that's kind of where uh, I need to supplement my capital so I can go and free my time to go and do what I'm basically pursuing. Right. And then the tax benefits is the mortgage interest deductions and, and depreciation. So for instance, I'm in Massachusetts. I don't have bonus depreciation and some investors might have, have bonus oh, depreciation. No, go away. Outside of that, um, wealth preservation. If you're just trying to sustain what you have, it, you know, it's not good to just hold on to it. So if it's your last 50K, don't invest it. I always tell my investors, don't invest your last 50K. If that's your savings, I'm not taking it. The reason why is I don't need you coming to me asking me for it because that was your savings account. Right. You know, um, outside of that, it, if you do have a hundred grand and you got a good savings, I don't like sitting on my capital. In fact, if I have a lot of capital in a bank, I'm looking for a new investment to put it in. The reason why is I know the bank is eating my capital. It's it, every day the dollar's getting lower in value. So that's just kind of my, my thought process. So I kind of keep it moving. If I can keep it moving, I can keep it coming. I can keep it coming. So that's kind of how I think of it. It's a, like a, a, a revolving door for me. Sure. And then the advantages of a, a real estate fund is it, it's basically the diversification is what really what investors really like about it because in a syndication it's transactional deal by deal where you can go ahead and it's good i think syndications however you're investing in real estate whether it's real estate uh, residential commercial syndications or fund i think you're already you're already doing the right thing i, I like the fact that as you start to evolve and you start to progress through different, there's different levels to this thing, right? So you, you probably heard that saying before. So the fun is like, all right, I already know what I'm doing. If I had this bunch of, this chunk of capital, I could take down that, 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 that. I could take down a whole block if I wanted to, or I can take down the three biggest assets or the three best assets that come across in, in different states that you, uh, that you already invest in. So basically the diversification, the diversification factor, if I am an investor that's investing solely in syndications, here's the process. I have to, re I, one, I have to connect with the sponsors. I have to trust them. Two, I have to review their offerings. Three, I might have to sit in their, their webinars. Four, I might want to underwrite the deal. Five, I just got to make the decision then, right? So that's, that's basically the five-step process of investing in a syndication. How about we do that once and go ahead and, and invest in a fund? And when you're investing in a fund, what you want to do is you want to make sure you, you know what the fund is going to be investing in. That's basically where the investor needs to know what kind of opportunities we're going to invest. Are we going to invest in mobile home parks, self-storage, multifamily? My funds, I prefer... I only stick to my bread and butter. That's multifamily, commercial multifamily. I'm not looking at residential. I'm not looking to go do a bunch of fix and flips. I'm just doing straight commercial multifamily. I'm pretty specific and that's it. Um, the preferred returns, similar to a syndication. Professional management, similar to a syndication. Tax benefits, similar to a syndication. And qualifications, if you're a credited or non-credited. If it's a 506B, 506C. Uh, Jamie, do we are we familiar with those terms the whole group yeah i see i was gonna that was one of the questions i'm gonna ask you if um you know based on it, it, when you register and file with the sec is this still like a reg d regulation or is it 5068 what exactly do you have to file with them for to actually do a fund versus a syndication great question whatever way you want to go ahead and, and and tackle it so a lot of people think that if i could advertise this i'd be able to raise all the capital not so much the truth. You got to have a track record. You got to have some, um, you know, some, some kind of like cachet behind you right? to be able to do that. Now the marketing is all great. If you're a great marketer, you might be able to do it, you know, but if, if, if you have a bunch of friends and family, 506B, the relationships you already have work on those and go from there. So uh, your attorney will literally drill you for these, whoever you're using to drop these documents, 
excuse me, saying, where's your strong suit? Mm-hmm. Where do you think you can, you know, find more? They'll, they'll talk you through it to find out where your focus is or where you have the best potential of succeeding at that. If you find the right attorney, that is. Um, so 506B, <coughs> you can use your own network. 506C, everybody has to be accredited and you have to validate the accreditation. You need to use a third party. You can use verifyinvestor.com, which they go ahead and pay 59 bucks and then and they go and get uh, self-verified and then they bring you back the documents. Or you can have your attorney draw up a document where um, they hand to their CPA and their CPA uh, uh, basically determines their accreditation status instead of them. So it's always kind of like not the person, it's someone else accrediting the, um, so, Validating it. Validating their, yeah, their yeah. accreditation. I gotcha. Instead of them doing it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. But if it's a 506B, only 35 non-accredited can be part of that. And then it is that word of mouth where um, John might be like, yes, I am an accredited investor. And you got you just take their word for it. You don't have to validate anything. Gotcha. Okay. You, but, know, you but- can always be like, well, he told me. You know, so right, <laughs> sure, sure. So, but so if I actually wanted to do a fund versus just one a property, though, I can still use a five hundred six B. I don't have to have anything different. I didn't know that. Okay, cool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so if you want to raise a fund and say you guys pull together like two million out of this group, and you're like, we're gonna buy four assets in the New York area, and we're just gonna go ahead and, you know. We're going to do, that's the plan, right? Four mm-hmm. multi-family units. We don't know what the size is going to be, but it's going to meet the range of 500,000 a piece. Okay. Right? <clears throat> what, you, what you'll do is you'll set up the documentation just like you would a syndication. That's it. Huh. That's it. And there'll be a manager. There'll be a, you know, just like the syndication, a GP and an LP side. And then that's okay. it. So you establish those documents beforehand. And then let's say you find the property, you know, three months later, do you have to go back and revisit some of that documentation to update anything or? No, once you, once you have all your commits and everybody probably there's, there's a couple of ways you can draw down the capital. You can draw down the capital day one. You can draw down the capital with per each investment. Hmm. Um, there's, there's no wrong way to do it. It's just have your your documentation set up so that it gives you some runway to to find the assets. So if you take down all the capital day one, you have three months, four months to invest that without having to start paying the pref on it. Got it. Very cool. Okay. That's awesome. So yeah, just, it's just a more information about that. I think uh, the, the, so the fund can typically be 10 years, right? So that's basically because the hedge fund game, that's what they do with their funds. But if you're looking to take down a bunch of different properties, you're not going to do a fund with less than, like you're not going to do a five-year syndication uh, paperwork for the fund, right? Right. So you'll probably do like a seven-year, even though your goal is to probably get out in six or five or whatever. You might even want to do eight. Your, your, your attorney will probably tell you do seven with a one year extension, because you never know if one year, one of your assets you bought in year four and you're approaching year seven and that's only three years of holding on that, you might want to hold it an extra year. Gotcha. You you have those options and the flexibility of a fund, but excuse me, one thing is there's no reinvestment of capital. So what I mean by that is if we exited in three years or four years on, on the first investment, we're not putting that capital back into the fund. Any exit is going back to the investors. Uh, the reason why is you want to start, you probably already started fund two. That's uh, why. So you don't want to keep an ongoing fund one. You want that to come to an end eventually. And then you're focusing on fund two. So just to give you an idea, you guys raise $2 million fund one. Four years from now, you decide to raise another fund. I think we can do 4 million now. And then three years from there, I think we can do 8 million now. And as those are dissolving, you're starting to create funds, but you're taking down all this assets 
And guess what? You're probably buying the whole the whole state at that point. <laughs> yeah, no, I see the uh, scalability of it. That's pretty cool. Yeah, so we just talked about it. Um, basically, the structure, basically the investments on the bottom layer. The real estate fund is right there. And then the investors get paid first, and then the management company goes goes ahead. So all the assets are reporting to the real estate fund. So I know John and Gary probably um, <clears throat> underwrite for a 70-30 split, right? Here's the thing. If you're taking down, if you're taking down assets, go ahead. Sorry, someone's, uh, I'm just putting them on mute. Oh, no worries. So if you're taking down assets already underwriting for a 70-30 split, in my opinion, I personally think you could write, underwrite it since the, the, Fund is already at a 70-30 split. You can underwrite the investments at 100% because you're not splitting that investment. Everything's reporting to the fund and then the split happens. Oh. So traditionally in a syndication, deal by deal, you're underwriting for a 70-30. But as you're underwriting these type of opportunities for a fund, you need them to basically achieve a hundred percent because you're not splitting them at that investment level. Gotcha. So if that makes sense to anybody outside of John, Jamie, and, and Gary, feel free to ask questions on that. Uh, I, I don't mind, but this is basically the call down process that, that I explained earlier. Uh, you, you can identify assets and then uh, call them down to investors that's already committed. So I'll use an example. Uh, Jamie's in, uh, committed a hundred thousand, signed all the paperwork, and I told him, upon the PPM signatures, just wire twenty five, twenty five percent. I'm sorry. <clears throat> so he wires me twenty five thousand, and that's with everybody. So I'm using Jamie as the example of the one loan investor here. So now I take the twenty five thousand, I go and I buy a property, and now I identify another property. Jamie, I identified another property. Gonna need 50% uh, 50 now. I'm this for 75%, and then so on and so on. But now let's say in the investment period, I don't find, I identify another property. We're in this fund, two properties. He's at 75%, 75,000. At the end of an investment uh, sourcing term, I can say, hey, we released those no longer committed at 100. You are in at 75 because we did not identify. We're not trying to find deals just to find deals for the sake of the fund. We're mm -hmm. trying to find deals that make sense for the fund. Gotcha. That's, that's, the, that's the way you kind of go ahead and organize and structure and plan that type of process. So what is that? the investment process is obviously we're sourcing leads, we're underwriting the deal, we're trying to gain exclusivity because of the due diligence, trying to look at the asset once it's under contract and then um, maybe even renegotiate. But obviously um, we're, we're probably, that should probably be in the uh, ahead of the gain exclusivity and the due diligence, but there, the due diligence actually is probably part of right, right where it is. And then right after the negotiation process, because I would say you need to do some sort of due diligence before you want to go ahead and put in an LOI. Sure, right? sure. So you, I would say you the due diligence is definitely before and after the negotiating purchase price. Now, the capital rate of the, of the fund is if you already have the fund, you can go ahead and close whenever you want after inspections and all of that. You can, you know, maybe bump up the dates, hopefully with the seller or... If you're syndicating, the difference is you're raising the money during, uh, let's say you're raising this money as you have the deal under contract. So you see where that position is right there, right? So you see how uh, sometimes there's that six-day window where you're trying to raise cattle yeah. and float it all at the same time. Yeah, so it's a lot of work at the same time. That takes that away. Right, right, yeah. exactly. So the investment life cycle is this, I think we talked about it, is the formation of the, of the fund structure. And then we'll raise capital. And then we can go ahead and start making acquisitions. And, and then once we purchase everything or we purchase something, you know, you hear the common, go John and Gary can attest to this. Now the real work begins whenever someone <laughs> closes, right? So you hear that all the time, right? But the oh, real yeah. work is, is, is from day one to day uh 
day 100 when it's over. And then you got the reposition. That's part of the operations, right? So that, those go hand in hand. Uh, you're making sure you got the, the operations. You're making sure you got the right team in there. Are you keeping the current property management team? Are you self-managing? Are you actually um, going to um, replace the property management team? So you got to make those decisions too. Uh, and then reposition. You got to trust the property management team to go ahead and do what, they, what you need to be done because you know what the business plan is, right? And construction costs go up, so you got to pencil in for that. I mean, when do prices really go down, right? Right. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> and then you start looking for your exit, your refinance or your sell. So the way I underwrite deals, and I think John and Gary and, and, and Jamie understand this, is we never underwrite with a refinance in the deal because we want the deal to look strong without the refinance. Because if an investor comes back and says, John, you told me we were going to refinance in year three. What happened? Now, now they're going to hold me to that, right? Mm -hmm. So things can change and you, you can't refinance. Like COVID, right? A lot right, of, exactly. A lot Great of, example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So now these, these, these investors are like, yeah, you told me a refinance. I was going to get a return of a portion of my capital. What's going on? So that's basically the life cycle of the deal. Um, and then here's the, the timeline. So basically when you start those documents and now you're fundraising, it's a lot of calls. I like to tell people when I'm sourcing deals, investors are on my time because I'm trying to find a deal. But when I am, uh, and I don't mean that in disrespect. I'm just saying I have a window yeah. of time that I allocate to people, to, you know, investors. Right. <clears throat> but if I'm raising capital, I'm on their time. So if they're in California and they want to talk to me at California, nine o'clock at California time, I'm on the East coast. I got to be on that call. That's what it takes to raise capital. It, it, you have to be on the time of the investor at that point, because it's, it's their decision. Now you can bring the opportunity all you want, but they got the final say. Sure. Um, then um, the sourcing and closing opportunities. You see that four-year window. It could be three-year. It could be two-year. However long you want to do it. On a 10-year fund, we'll make it four years. And now you see why the fund is 10 years, right? Yeah. And then you're managing and improving. Say so you took something down day one. Yeah, that's fine. And then the exits. The exits can typically happen anywhere from like, I like to say three to 10 because you never know, but at the end of the day, right. five to 10 seems, seems pretty reasonable. You're trying to hold it for five, right? Sure. That's the goal. Uh, you're not trying, but the plan is to raise for, uh, hold for five. And then um, if someone comes away and blows you away at year three, like I said, you gotta know what's right for your investors. Right. <clears throat> never depend on a single income. I mean, obviously passive, uh, Passive streams of income is, is, is what we strive for. We're always trying to, you know, create that second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. So keep doing it. And then the sources of fun. Uh, for instance, people in this group, if you invested in, in a John or Jamie or Gary type of deal, private and individual, you're a private investor, right? But also there's other ways that they can raise capital through pension funds. There's a software out there for, called Prequin. If you're on Prequin, you can start networking <clears throat> with a bunch of fund managers. And what I mean by fund managers, they're usually pension fund endowments, foundations, inst institutional investors, insurance companies, and universities, all looking to, to deploy. Maybe they have a $1, trillion, $1 million, I mean, a $1 billion fund, and they allocate 25% to real estate. They're looking for real estate people on there. Uh, family offices, <clears throat> excuse me. I just interviewed uh, Richard Wilson who runs familyoffice.com. Family offices work differently. They're looking mainly not to invest as an LP in deal. They look to JV in deal. So if you come to them with an opportunity, one, they're looking at the fees, but they're looking at it in a manner of, <clears throat> we want you to basically, they look, they're not removing your fees to remove your fees and, and be greedy about things. They're making you 
they give you incentive. They want you to work. So to, just to explain that is 2% asset management fee. Um, and let's say there's a disposition fee and it's a 70-30 split. Fair to single investors, I think that's pretty fair. <clears throat> but a family office is gonna say, take away the disposition, take away the asset management fee. Also, we'll give you back, they might say, we'll give you back all your earnest, we'll fund the deal, but now it's 64 and you guys operate it. I'll take it. Sure. <laughs> I mean, so it's not about the acquisition fee at the end of the day. A lot of people get hung up on, and I have an investor that will not invest in a deal that has an acquisition fee. And it's just a, a old way, old school way of, of them coming through of lifestyles and in, in unlimited. Right. It's a, it's a group out of Texas. They started, uh, I might even, I can't remember exactly where they started, but they grew and they, they, they basically, uh, they have these principles that they, sh they, they share with their investors. And one of them is not investing in the deal with the acquisition fee. And I explained to them, I said, look, acquisition fee for me is not me eating for my family. Acquisition for me is basically getting the capital and going to buy a bigger deal afterwards. Because if I'm putting my earnest funds in the deal and then I'm gaining the acquisition fee, the goal with that acquisition fee is to basically make it bigger so i can go and take down a bigger asset right for investors uh obviously bigger is is a better scale so uh, that's what i want to do with my investors and i i share that with him and i told him that's not how i go ahead and operate i look to go ahead and scale with the acquisition fee to bring you a bigger deal at the end of the day so um but there's a lot of people that just are raising or being part of deals just to get a piece of acquisition fee and and you know, whatever, whatever, whatever their, their reason is. I mean, you know, everybody's situation is different. I'm not here to talk about that, but I'm just talking about how the acquisition fee helps you scale to bigger things because you're already there to scale anyways. You're already investing in the syndication to scale anyways. So these are the different types of companies that are sourced for capital. And then the five important elements is obviously the term. Like I said, it could be seven to 10 years. It all depends on the fund. And then the management, you know, vet the sponsors. You guys know that. Trust the sponsors. If you trust someone, you're most likely to invest with them. Um, yeah. So basically the market, you got to know the market, understand the market. If you understand the market, you know, they say invest where you want to retire, you know, that's what, the, or invest in your own backyard. That's the biggest things that they say. So no one's invested in an area where they don't want to travel to, right? So uh, the preferred return and the split, <clears throat> Usually there's a, a waterfall that's called a waterfall. So the first hurdle is usually the preferred return. Everybody you think is familiar with the preferred return. If there's a eight pref, you're going to get 8% of the cash flow before the managers get paid. Uh, that's basically uh, a lot of managers pay themselves first, the ac uh, asset management fee before the pref. And then there's a lot of managers where they'll, they'll pay the, the investors first and then the, the asset management fee to them afterwards through the cash flow and then distribute the rest 70, 30. That's basically the structure of, of the waterfall. Um, and then there's usually a, um, a, a, a split a exit on a 50, 50 split on an exit, but usually that's on the back end. So if the, if the sponsor does what, he's, what he said he was gonna do, I think he should be compensated that way. And for instance, if it's a 70-30 split and we said we're going to double your money and uh, in five years or whatever, or and we reach those goals, I think it, it's only fair to go jump that to a 50-50 split. Sure. And usually you don't see, you might see that with experience and syndicators and sponsors. But also if you don't see that, it's because usually sometimes it's a new sponsor where they want to, you know, you treat your investors good on the first couple, right? So right. you give them almost everything and then later on they invest everything with you. So that's the thought process. Uh, you become financial free when your passive income exceeds your expenses. I think um, that's what everybody's trying to do, chase and pursue their goals and you know do what they love, do what they love for the rest of their life. Right. Uh, these are the primary markets we focus in, but you know, the, the, the Southeast, the, 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 um, the rustic belt line and um, basically Colorado, Texas, uh, Tennessee, 
and um, Georgia, Florida, and Kentucky. Uh, my, my, my markets where I invest in. And like I said, I'm out of Boston. And these are just areas where I find, I, I like to find value deals. Mom and pops, best type of people to buy from. Um, people that are inherited the property that don't know how to manage it. That's basically how we bought the 62, uh, the 62 unit. And then um, there's um, sadly deaths that happen that the partner might have died and they need to dissolve the, the interest of the of their investment and stuff like that. So, or divorces. So that's basically the biggest reasons why we're, how we're sourcing deals. Excuse me, we're trying to identify those type of um, opportunities and then go ahead and, and, and taking them over. And then uh, basically the acquisition process is the high quality. Yeah, this, these are the type of opportunities we're looking for, the high quality, Assets, 1999, minor rehab, 500 to 5K uh, worth of rehab per unit. And then there's the value add. That's, that's the one that's thrown out there the most where you hear everybody, yeah, it's a value add, value add. Value add, um, those are the under market rents. It's going to take some time to get up, get the cash flow higher, but it's worth it. You know, it, it, it's definitely worth it. Um, that, it's already cash flow, but you, it's under market. The financially distressed, the, the that means they are running out of capital. They need to do something, um, divorce or, you know, just name it. They're, they're currently going through it and they need an exit. Physically distressed, you can just look at it and you know it needs work. <clears throat> and then the owner management distressed means it's bad, poor management in there. It's kind of with a, another type of value add component in there, but it's just a, a, a different way of um, identifying assets. Hey, is that manager really good? And as you start becoming aware of your locations, you know which property management teams are better than others. Right. And I think John and, 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 and uh, Gary can attest to that. <laughs> <laughs> so our, our last, last projects, the, the 528, the Buffalo Ridge is the one that we did. We put up that new sign there. Um, and then uh, the Vista Ridge is the one we actually exited on. Uh, and then uh, we just uh, had a, we were part of another deal, 167 units in Augusta. So who doesn't want to go to Augusta, right? So give me a reason to go to these places. That's where we're going to invest in. Sure. <clears throat> and, you know, just, just another headline here. And then basically what, I, what, else I, what else I offer at the Fortes company is I help consult where I have a few meetings coming up about funds, right? People are connecting me with people because I've been on their podcast talking about funds and I just got a few emails and LinkedIn notifications about connecting people that are interested in learning about funds. So I went off and created my own calculator because there wasn't one that I could find out there. Um, I created one that if you're, here's, here, here's a way that you can help. If you have a network, right? Um, and you come across a bunch of deals because you've already started net, uh, networking with a bunch of sponsors and you know who, which sponsors you would invest in that you've built relationships with, raise a $1 million fund and go and deploy 250 in those sponsors deals at a pop. Diversify that way. And I've, I designed a calculator that, per, you know, gives, shows the returns on those on something that Maybe your fund is a, you know, because they're going through you and you're playing the middleman, you're investing in those syndications as an LP, but it is a different structure process. You got to fill out a form with the, with the attorney, an exempt RIA form, because you're not consulting advice. You're not giving consulting advice. You're, mm. you're just building a fund that is going to go and invest it as an LP in other deals. So you're the GP of the fund. And you're going to invest it in all these great deals that you have already sourced and been a part of. Because as a firm, I'm reviewing hundreds of deals a quarter, let alone the, the individual investor that is reviewing probably, let's say, five deals, maybe a quarter, because they know maybe two sponsors. I like my odds of finding a deal and reading out the good and the bad because of my experience of being able to underwrite and being able to basically know what's going on in the industry because I'm already plugged in. Um, 
you know, giving your investors a stick and going and investing in, in seven, eight pref type deals, you know, everybody wins and you can still double their capital and that's those type. And a lot of people, if you go ahead on bigger pockets, you'll find a few people pushing back on those types saying, Hey, how go get feed twice? Well, you're not feed twice really, because on a prospectus, here's what happens. Here's what your projected returns look like. This is what, this is what we're forecasting. Those are already built in with the fees. You already know what you're going to, you know, what you're likely to get. So if you trust the sponsor and you've already invested with them before, you know that your fees on top of that is not really double feed. You already see what the returns are on the fees. So they're only paying your fees. If that makes sense, that's how it makes sense for me. And that's how I, I figured it out from there and built the calculator. And then uh, obviously uh, Eric Thomas, he's one of the best motivational speakers and, you know, at some point you got to unleash the potential. So it starts by doing so like I, like I started, I started with a single family and then I started networking like John and, and Gary and, and, and Jamie are doing and just found that opportunity out there and partnered it up. And then all of a sudden raised the capital and they did it. These are your guys, man. These are your guys. They're doing it. And then that's where you can find me. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Well, that's great. Well, it's actually, um, it's interesting. You, you shed some light on the whole concept of a fund. I just didn't view it that way. But I, and I also didn't realize that it could be set up very similar to what we're already doing. And, um, and then basically, it's the same process we're already doing. <laughs> and it's just instead of trying to do it for every single property you're trying to purchase, you just got to try to do it maybe once. And then you can just deploy that capital to every property that you want to find. So that's, I, I like that. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I actually had to create two calculators, right? One for, I call it the JV Elite Forecaster, right? So uh, you're still going to underwrite these deals using a syndication calculator, mm -hmm. right? But you're, you're not going to do like the 70-30 split with it because your fund is going to determine what those returns look like anyways. Right. So if you want to underwrite those deals for the 70-30 split individually and see if they map out, great. And then go ahead and push it to 100 um, that by underwriting at the 70, 30 split on the deal level, will give you an idea if you, your fund will make money, but then once you know that the fund will make money, say it's given off like eight, eight prep or whatever, whatever it's given off. I mean, right. it's meeting like 10% cash on cash return, 8% cash on cash return. You can go ahead and put it in at a hundred and now map it to the fund. So, um, I, I started a, a calculator that'll do one for just uh, fund of funds and then one for uh, just JV opportunities. I'm trying to find the time to go ahead and marry the two so we can just sell one calculator and then put it in as, oh, if it's a fund of fund, it'll go in this bucket. If it's a JV opportunity, it'll go here. So instead of having two type of calculators doing uh, the same thing for you. So yeah, so I, I had to really reverse engineer that and think through that process and then figure out, Hey, I want everything, all my investments on one page and be able to go ahead and see how it would perform with the fund. So it, it's, it's starting to become a common practice right now. And man, I, I, I see a lot of people already that are interested. If you, if you raise capital already and people are out there raising capital, I don't see why you wouldn't raise your own capital because here's what it does. Sometimes when you're raising capital for these other big syndicators or other groups or other partners in general, some, some companies going to have to manage all their investors, right? Right to shield your investors from other people because you don't want your investors to be approached by other people. You got to raise a fund and invest with the fund. And now you report back to the fund like that, right. you know, you report to your fund. So right. I think it's a cleaner way to raise capital. It's more expensive. Yes. But it saves you the time because you're putting in all the work anyways, to go and find your investors network, have these conversations and then raise this capital just to hand them off at the end of the day. It doesn't make sense to me. 
Got you. Hey, hey John. Yeah. So uh, just a question. Um, the return on the fund, does the return uh, come before the investment is determined? Or does the return um, change? Like let's, you know, you were giving an example of, you know, somebody wants to invest $100,000, but the first uh, call might be a quarter of that, 25,000. So, um, and that's because you, you found the deal. Now that deal is underwritten and it's gonna, you know, provide some kind of a return. Um, when people invest in the fund, do they already know what the return's going to be? Or is it dependent upon the de different deals that come in? Can you see my screen right now? Yeah. Yes. I'm going to do one more thing. Make it big enough so you can see. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I designed it literally so I can go ahead and copy and paste this out and say, hey, this is what I'm projecting for the fund. Hmm. Now, this is what I'm saying the fund is going to do eight pref. You can see that I'm not touching the eight pref. I am in year three, in year four, in year five. And that traditionally is a value add play. Value add plays never pay pref day one. And a lot of people are over raising to just give you a return of your capital back as part of the pref going forward. So mm. this is pretty consistent with my type of deals that I'm finding and the way I would wanna model my type of deals. So you can see I'm doubling the capital through the life of the meeting, basically the on average, my cash on cash return. And this is only three investments at $3 million, $3 million taken down at $1 million a piece. So you can see that my fund is set up to give my investors 8% and then we're gonna split anything about 8, 70, 30, and that's it. Now your investors, my LPs are here And this is basically all the LPs performance of the fund. And I can break it down to an individual investor right here and say, hey, uh, Gary, you want to throw 50,000 into the deal? That's what it looks like. Right. No. Oh, that's 500,000, sorry. Uh, yeah, we, yeah, we get that. So th let me ask you this then, John. If you're... If you're investing in the fund and you purchase multiple properties, I, I'm guessing that you, you can take all that depreciation, which is going to be a lot more than you might get in just one property, <clears throat> push that down to the investors. Absolutely. It's just like a syndication, right? So right. what we're doing is we're going to gather five K, we're going to gather these three K ones, right? And that's another benefit to that too, is because you're investing in the fund, you're getting one K one, but all these three, these three properties are part of that. Hmm. So yes, we are passing on the tax benefits to the investors because that's one of the major factors of why people invest in real estate. Cool. So is it just a, say oh, your fund. accountant's handling that. Right, right, right. Yeah. Oh. That's why we have a accountant for our, my, my, my accountant. He's well-versed in real estate. He does all my stuff. Um, he's actually a partner with me on my 62 unit. Um, and he, he, he understands that we'd be doing each unit, each in investment would be doing a cost seg, but we'd be reporting it down and trickling down to the investors through the fund. That's very cool. Hmm. So John, if you, if you raise, you start a fund, and you're going to raise $2 million. Is there like a timeline that you give your investors that, because obviously you don't have a deal in hand, you're just, you're raising money to go out, find deals. What if you don't find a deal in a certain amount of time? Is there like a timeline saying where we might stop this fund if there's nothing found and fits this model that I'm looking for at a certain point? That That's a I mean, great how, question. How was the safety net? Yeah, that's a great question. You can always put in your documents that if we do not find, let's say we don't find a deal in three months of our allocated window because maybe uh, whatever, whatever reason why you can't find a deal, mm -hmm. right? 
you can say, COVID. Hey, I know someone that has a fund, a $1 million fund that is paying 1% to the investors on unused capital. That's basically the bank. You know what I mean? So whatever the money is doing in the bank account sitting, because he's collecting it as he gets it, which I think is a more efficient way because if you have to do a call down, I don't want to call down to Jamie and say, I, I used you earlier, Jamie. I'm just going to pick on you. Yeah, you um, Jamie, I, I found an investment for the additional 25% remaining of your investment. You're going to be like, well, I, I already used that, John. I, uh, I don't have it. I don't want to <laughs> risk that. I'd rather have it all up front right. and pay that 1% if I don't do anything. So that's kind of where it is, where I stand with that. So I, there's different ways to, to, to look at it. You can, yeah. everything's, everything's could be added in your PPM or, or whatever it is. So if you got unused capital in your fund, you're only using, you know, paying a 1% on it. You can, you can implement that on your PPM. That's a great question. Yeah, so there's a lot of flexibility. It sounds like it's really up to you, the person making the fund how you want to do it. Yeah, absolutely. You, you got to protect yourself as well as your investors because you don't want to pay 8% on, on this capital. Right. It doesn't make sense. And your investors obviously got to understand that as well. But you can pay the 1% on the, on the, on the, you know, to the investors if it's building interest in a bank account. If you got a 1 million in a bank account, you're going to get some sort of interest. So you just give that back to the investors. Interesting. That's really cool. Also, so, what what a lot, what a few people do is they find bank accounts that probably give, you know, one one point five. I don't know if you're gonna find anything giving two percent with capital like that. If you feel like that's gonna be an issue, find that type of an account. Right ahead of time. That makes sense. And also, a big time. sorry. Uh, I think I got one more thing on it. Also, a good thing is too if you have a let's say a, a two million dollar fund, John. You can go to a bank and say, can I get a line of credit on this fund? So that's another added pro to that too. So you can get a line of credit. Let's say they want to give you $100,000 line of credit on that. So if you are drawing capital, uh, drawing capital as a call down practice, um, let's say you have already exhausted that and you go to the bank and you say, hey, I have this fund. I want a, a line of credit on it. And now you you got fund two coming along, but you haven't even um, raised capital on it yet, but you know you're going to raise capital on it. And you're coming across some investments. You can go ahead and start raising capital for your fund. Use your line of credit to do some earnest capital for, for some deals, raise that capital, and then go ahead and pay off that line of credit as you start getting in capital, your funds in. That's what my mentor does right now. He has a, uh, I believe he has like a $500,000 line of credit. Huh. That's pretty cool. There's definitely a lot of flexibility there. It's pretty, uh, so let me ask you then, um, you, when did you start kind of going towards this path? Maybe like six months ago, eight months ago with fun driven more and then instead of just kind of your typical syndication. I joined a mastermind and it just made sense because my buddy who started the mastermind came off a the, the mastermind before that so he this was like his second session mastermind with a new group and we were just talking it was like yeah you know a couple guys in the other group it was more like a um a session for them and they kind of went together in on a partnership on a on a, a subscription for for one of those prequent models together and they started exploring reaching out to institutional funds institutional capital to raise like a $3 million fund or something like that. So what they did was they, they had all these discussions about funds and it just kind of piqued my interest. And I just started, I don't know, diving into it. So that was at the beginning of the year during COVID. So I think I, I spent the whole 2020 learning about funds. I signed up for one of those like Marcus and Millichap like market insights. I usually almost... Um, for some reason, I, I, oh my God, send the messages. <laughs> so for some reason, I, I, I signed up for this thing. It was in the middle of COVID. It was just something to do. And I just met someone there who already works with funds. And he just was so gracious to give me some time during the, the session. So he 
he, he came off the panel. He was part of the panel. He came off the panel and I do what I do best. I just pepper them with questions. <laughs> and he's like, you're asking all these questions. What do you do? I, told, I was like, well, I do a few syndications and this and that, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, interesting. All right, cool. So find out he's from Boston. He moved to Florida and he lives out in Florida and he raises all this capital. He, his first fund was a 10 million fund, then went to a $30 million fund and then went to a $100 million fund. And now he's raised on a $400 million fund. Wow. And he's like, it's a lot of phone calls. It's a lot of work. Uh, look at I. I RAI firms or RIA firms, call them and ask them if they're um, looking at um, alternative investments and start having those conversations, start exploring, start going to the conferences and having those type of conversations with them. And then I was asking them like very, very nitpicky things about, not nitpicky, but like specific, like how are you managing uh returns how are you projecting returns how are you structuring them uh just little conversations like that uh and what i do is when i get them on the phone we just go because we can just both go but when it's on email i ask him one question at a time something quick boom because i know he's raising capital so i i'm very respectful of his time i set up ahead of time I actually have a podcast with him coming out soon. He's very, very, he has like good practices that I've, he, he tells me all the time. He goes, go to my website, steal it, steal everything you see on there, steal the information. And if you're good at implementing things, steal things that you like from other people and implement it and go, because that's how you build your business. Yeah. But yeah I've heard that. I, 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 I got involved with it about a year ago and, I, I love it. Yeah. I've heard people say that if you, if you see something that you, you think you can do, but if you, even if you can do it better then do it, you know, there's always a way to improve. I, I've learned a lot in the last couple of years of being around syndicators and I've learned some pretty cool methods for lots of different things. So, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I was just actually, that was going to be one of my questions to you is how in 2020 have you had to modify your business uh, due to COVID and you kind of answered some of it, but. Oh, another thing too, is where there was a lot of, um, SEC coming down on certain yeah. groups for malpractice of capital raising. And it, it was almost like, um, almost like uh, if you're a, a, if you're a registered broker or something like that, you could raise capital, get a fee for it and go away or whatever it is. But it, it, it felt like that they were starting to target groups where that they knew that they were raising a lot of capital, but had, a bunch of people in the GP. So I said, you know what? I got a family to protect. I'm trying to do this the right way. Fund model is the best way. How come people are not talking about this more? So I started going on every podcast and, and screaming about it. So I think the first podcast I probably ever did, if I ever go back and listen to it, I probably sound foolish, but hey, you got to start somewhere because now the, the amount of information I know about funds because I'm, I'm just comparing myself from here, then to now. Sure. I'm just saying, I think I sound foolish, but I probably sound very, you know, novice, but informative. But now I feel like I can give, you, you asked me a question, I probably already asked it and got the answer seven times. Oh yeah, I, I can relate to that just in real estate in general. I mean, a couple, two or three years ago, <laughs> I didn't really know anything about doing this. So I know exactly what you're talking about. You you have to ask questions and just, uh, and that's how you grow and learn. Great. Uh, speaking of, of that, you know, if anybody wants to ask ahead. any questions, feel free and ask them. Well, I had a quick question. Did, did you uh, mention assuming debt? Are you a fan of uh, of assuming large amounts? Of, if 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 uh, if a deal is kind of out of reach, but it has assumable uh, mortgages, even at a slightly higher rate than you would want. Right now, everybody's assuming debt. A lot of groups. Uh, a lot of groups apartment wise, but with yield maintenance, yeah. yield maintenance is expensive to pay. So what they're doing now is they're, for instance, something came across my desk today in Florida, two package deal. You got to buy this one. They want you to buy that one. It's assumable for 3.6. Um, and 
that's the way deals are going right now because no one wants to pay those prepayment penalty. And even if you said, nah, I want to buy them out right there, probably going to push back on you and say, Hey, can, can, can you assume this? And you got to be able to be qualified from that if you're going agency. So the agency is going to underwrite you. They're going to make sure that um, you are qualified. You got to have a strong KP. Also, if you are going to assume it, which is very favorable right now, the best part about uh, assuming debt right now, if you're going ahead and bringing in new debt, there's a lot of COVID reserves that you got to start bringing to the table. So you got to raise more capital. Mm -hmm. When you're assuming, it avoids the COVID reserves. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's a very good point. Uh, there's still those requirements for, for COVID, you know, 12 months or 18, depending on what you're using. So you got to yeah. raise that much more to keep those reserves. They went from right. nine to 12 and I think right to 18. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, does anybody else have any other questions? Hey, John, it's Joe Janowski. Um, hey, Joe. I, I, how are you? I have a, a financing and a, and a brokerage background, but one thing that you said earlier that that piqued my interest was, you know, when you've got when you've got the first fund set up, and you haven't fully established the second, and you want to, you know, go to the bank and, and get a line of credit. I assume, having been a banker that they want to secure that you weren't, were, were you suggesting using the funds that, that you haven't, that you haven't, you know, put to work in the first fund as collateral for the line of credit to go towards the second? Well, you, you're going to be able to talk about that with the bank as well. So uh, I'm still learning about that too, but you being a banker, you probably could tell me more. Uh, you're probably going to use it on the unused funds. And it, maybe you want to do it early in the fund where you already have the capital and unused capital. You want to go ahead and apply for some of that, those um, lines of credits. So yeah. a lot of hedge funds already do it. They get lines of credit. I'm reading a great book by the guy who started Blackstone. I don't know if you guys know him. I think his name is James Schwartzman. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, he references the line of credit. I know my mentor uses a line of credit. That's something I got to dive with him. I can't really tell you exactly how you go get it, but I know you can apply for one and have it um, because you have one of these funds. It's, it's probably using the, the fund as collateral. Yes. Interesting. <clears throat> so I have to ask you this. Um, if, if you had to start all over today, knowing what you know now, Maybe what are like two or three tips you think you, you would uh, you give someone in this field? Just start. Ah. Just start. Um, talk to as many people as possible. My goal this year is I'm trying to talk to anybody and everybody. And my goal is to try to be the best network I can be because I did it all through high school. And I needed to back to that because it, it helps me, it helps me feel like in touch with people. Mm. So if I can have a conversation with you guys here, and then I come across another group and I say, Hey, Joe, you might want to go meet, excuse me. You might want to go, you know, introduce, I might want, you might be interested in me introducing you to um, Henry over here because Henry has some sort of a similar background to you. And I think it would be good for you guys to get connect, connected to each other. And you never know, man, where it's not that I want to be the matchmaker. It's just, I've always naturally done it with my friends and I still kind of pair people together and not in, not in a matter of like go and be partners or anything. But I, I feel like I have a good sense of fits and what maybe your business could use or hmm. maybe a simple conversation, Jamie said, and I'm like, Oh yeah, I have a guy for that. I can, I can connect you with that. Or maybe Jamie has a guy. And it's always being able to find out who does what. So one, I can expand my network and be like, okay, if I ever needed this, I know I can ask that question too. I, I ask a lot of questions. So Joe, I might reach out to you and ask you some banker questions. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> Appreciate you, bud. Yeah, no, uh, building teams and just networking. That's definitely one thing that I learned you have to do 
pretty early and just pretty consistently. Uh, and it totally pays off. You're absolutely right about that. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I think one thing going back to Joe's question is if I did, if I was going to dissolve fund one and have fund two, I definitely probably have to notify the bank and let them know that, Hey, uh, this fund is actually bigger than the other one. <laughs> so I don't know if the bank will have any issues with that, but I know I have to let them know because it's similar to, uh, I would say I would kind of equate it to if you're going to go refinance your house and you got a lock on it, you got to not notify them that you're doing that. Right. Uh, I'm assuming, but I, I don't know how that parallels with that correctly, but it just yeah, makes no, sense I, that you gotta let them know. <laughs> I, I think, I think there's a parallel on what I was, what I was thinking is if somehow something happened with, with the line of credit and, and, and well, getting fate, getting the second fund off the ground, and you'd already pledged, what? you'd already pledged the excess funds from, you know, from the first fund, the folks in first fund know nothing about two and two doesn't know anything about one. Well, usually if you're, if you're rolling out fund two, mm -hmm. you're probably already telling the investors you're rolling out fund two. You may, but isn't it a distinct legal entity, separate entity? Fund two? Yeah. Uh, if I got two funds and you wanted to invest in both of them, don't you think you're going to invest in both of them? Oh, absolutely. I'm just, I'm just wondering if, if, if to pledge, to pledge the, the unused funds from one. As oh, okay. Yeah. Two, that you'd get, have to get the consent of the investors yeah. in one to do, to do that. I see what you're saying now. Yes. I think, I think, um, I believe so because I, so you're saying if I have a hundred thousand dollar line of credit, I have mm -hmm. to keep a hundred thousand dollars in my fund if I want to use the line of credit, right? No, I'm just I'm saying that you need to offer the 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 the, the creditor, the lender, something you know collateral that doesn't, you know that's that's not already tied up. Yeah, I think I'm catching on to you. So you're well, saying be, I can't be. have. It'd be it'd be like owning it'd be like owning a two family house in Boston, and being short on the down payment, and then saying to the saying to the to the seller, "Hey, I'll give you I'll give you you know a second mortgage on this property over here," and the lender says, "What you know?" The first lender says, "What are you doing? You can't put additional financing yes. on my yeah. property." Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so. Yeah, it, that's just a, a conversation you'd have to have with the bank and, and whether and they're willing to give you that that line of credit on that. Yeah. That and your, that and your attorney. Yeah, absolutely. And I, the <laughs> thing is, what I was just trying to say is it's possible, basically. Yeah, right. It's yeah. definitely possible. They do it all the time. Right. And well, like every, like every document, some things, some things strictly prohibit it and other things are silent and you're free to do what you want. And I'm curious and... You have my, yeah, I got a question now that I'm going to go ahead and follow and, and, and yeah, I, I'm going to go and ask that question. All right. Yeah. I'm going to ask my mentor about um, that process and if they ever have to provide any of the equity to that line of credit, if the event that they were never able to be able to, for the fund. So mm -hmm. I'm I'm curious to know that now. So I love this. I love this that that you uh, brought that up, Joe. Well, I mean, it. What, that's what the cool part about it is that it just the flexibility to do so many different things in real estate in general, and that's just another example of of way people are just be able to be resourceful. Um, with it's another tool, really. I think about it. It's just yeah. it's just really cool. I think the best part about it is if you kind of do. You can actually do a 50-50 or you can say I'm allocate 25% of the fund to a fund of funds, meaning investing as an LP and 75% I'm going to take down my own deals or the fund is going to take down deals. The best part of that is if you are starting to learn about <laughs> mobile home parks or self-storage or whatever else, the best way to learn is investing as an LP and investing as an LP with that 25% in whatever direction you decide to go in real estate with it, as long as your documents are structured accordingly saying maybe it's just 
commercial real estate. You can just say it's all commercial real estate. Now, you, you know, even though your focus is multifamily, you're going to start diving in and dabbling into a little bit of other things and expanding your type and really starting to diversify within other real estate aspects as far as just not, not just diversifying location-wise, you get to diversify asset-wise. So that's kind of another neat aspect of it, of being able to keep it a fund of funds or keeping it a blend of do or keeping it all just, I'm just going to take down my own opportunities. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, I have observed that in the last 12 months or so, syndicators that kind of were very particular to just multifamily. And now you've seen them making offerings for storage or making offerings for mm -hmm. different types of things now. So uh, I, I could definitely see how th that would, that's very, very relevant. Yeah, well, I know I wanna... uh, John and Gary are, are strictly, and, and Jamie, I know you guys are probably like strictly multifamily, but we're always around so many other people that Man, they do mobile home. They do self storage. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm I'm interested in self storage because it's just mm -hmm. the the unique ways. But I'm not there yet, right? And I'm just I I know where my bread is buttered, and I'm good where where I am right now. When I start exploring that opportunity, it'll be basically when I'm ready to go ahead. When I feel like I got everything organized on a system here, hiring a few people here, hiring a few people there. Now I want those people to go ahead and go ahead, go and be in place to go ahead and you look straight at self storage, you look at mobile works, and now we get to branch out that way. I want to do it right when I'm doing it, but right now my bread and butter is multi. John, do you know anybody um, in your network that's doing the self storage now? That That is what is really hard to hear. Yeah, it will close to uh, do you know anybody that's doing self storage now in your um, in your network? Yeah, absolutely. One of my uh, limited partners uh, purchased her first self storage because she got a great deal and she's running it efficiently and she's looking. At one. <clears throat> nice. Yeah, yeah. She uh, I, she's doing well with it. Yeah. I got a quick question for you, John. Now you've been talking about your fund and, and starting a first one. Have you actually started doing any kind of raising a capital? Is it something you got a certain amount of time before you actually start doing your first fund? I've just been talking about it uh, with my attorneys, drawing up the, the documents. Um, I have plans. <laughs> I have plans for it. Yes. I, I do want to go ahead and do some, Obviously, yes, I'm going to be doing one, yes. But it's when, yeah. I don't know yet. I'm still structuring it to see if it's going to be 506C, 506B. Right. I have okay. uh, uh, an opportunity right now that me, me, and, um, me and a buddy of mine, we're, we're going to partner on something. Um, he already has a blind pool set up, so I'm going to be a part of that and helping him get off the ground with that. And his fund is not to be as a fund of fund that's just going to be go ahead and taking down multifamily assets. So the best part of that is uh, being able to have the capital on hand. It's just going to be a small one to three. Uh, it's either going to be a three dollar fund. Um, so the best part about that is being able to just, you know, as you're raising capital, you can go ahead and take down deals. So I'll give you an example as Dylan, who I spoke to today, is raising a $10 million fund, and he's already raised 3.6. And he's continuing to raise on that. But with that 3.6, he's already taken down two mobile home parks. So you can see that 3.6 got two, another 3.6 get another two, let's say, and then he'll get one more after that. So well diversified in that fund at five investments. So I rather have, uh, here's the benefits of that. So if I'm in five opportunities based off of one fund and this one is not performing well, I still got the strength of the other four. So that's basically the best part. Right. And if you're doing that with the syndication, with the one, not that it's wrong, but if you're doing one deal and then that goes sour, you know, you only waited off that one deal. That's that's the difference. Okay. Appreciate it, John.
Yeah, thanks. I really appreciate you jumping on and, and showing us this. Uh, it's it's really interesting to, to view it this way, and I actually haven't looked at it that way, so it was very helpful. No, I appreciate that, man. I feel like every time I mention fun to people and I explain it and, and, and dive into it, they, they start to feel the same way you do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think in this business, anything that's flexible uh, help you kind of reach your goals. And this is just another method of being able to utilize that. So it's, it's really great. Thanks for sharing. I really appreciate your time. No, thank you. My, my goal is at the end of the day is to make sure people are creating a firm that they can actually scale and grow and it'll help them, you know, change people's lives. So if I can help them teach them how I think is the best way to raise capital is I'm not going to teach you how to raise capital. I think you raise capital with your network. And, you know, if you're out there on social media and you get, you know, I, I personally think it starts in house first. Right? So if you have a great um, idea, your friends and family are going to probably invest in it first and th uh, watch shark tank how did you raise the money first oh friends and family we went to friends and family like it always starts that way yeah. so raise money friends and family and go put it to work and prove the model and or the best way to do it too is you start using all your capital invested in things and you just talk about it just talk about it just talk about it and then next thing you know people are like hey you think i can invest with you think i can do something with you one day and then all of a sudden you you're raising capital. You're not even knowing it. And that's how it works. It's just a lot of people put it in their head that raising capital is like, oh, I got to go and talk to like this uh, banker or something like that. Or right. just talk to your friends and family. It yeah. starts there. The way you can talk to them about it. And this is the way I, this is one of the things too. Um, if I can, like when I'm doing the podcast, I explain things like, I'm talking to a child because if you can teach a child something, you can teach anybody something. Right. Because kids, like the way they learn that, you know, sometimes you got to break it down. And the reason why I do that is because I got an IT background. And my boss always said, John, assume that they don't understand technical yes. jargon. Yes. So yeah. I say, all right. So I use a lot of examples and say, say you're doing it, whatever. <laughs> Yep. They get yeah. it. <laughs> I'm in IT. I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> you can't talk to them and like, you oh. know, you know <laughs> the throughput, yep. uh, you know, the bandwidth and blah, blah. they're like, what? I'm like, what? what? The of, <laughs> right. The amount of space it got to travel through, all right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How, how wide is it? You're good. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, I want to be you. Appreciate you taking yeah, the time. I appreciate it. Now, um, just before I go, we're not missing any questions out of the chat, right? I didn't have it up. Uh, no, I think we were just, people are just putting in their um, little info. Yeah, nobody had any questions in here, so I should be okay right there. I appreciate you guys' time. That's Gary, great John. Presentation, John. Thank we'll you. We'll talk anytime you guys yes. want. You guys already know. Absolutely. Um, uh, one nugget that I always leave you guys with is, and, and I learned this on the 62 unit, is we got, we got, buildings so what you do is you got three roofs to do do you hire one team to do it all three in the beginning you'll say yeah yeah you do that you can buy you you source out maybe get the guy that's maybe even not even the most expensive all right cool here's what you do you got three roofs you hire two different companies doesn't have to be the most expensive. Doesn't have to be the, the cheapest. Hire the two, two companies. Give you two different quotes. or They're, they're probably close in, in range. Hire both of them. Reason why is you tell them whoever does the best job wins the last roof. And I'll leave you with that. <laughs> both of the roofs will be the best roofs ever. <laughs> Always remember that. Hire two, like, and if you got a lot of work to do, hire two crews. Get it done quick. Yeah, so. that's good advice. Uh, thanks. I really appreciate that, John. Thanks for jumping on and uh, sharing us your wisdom. No worries. Feel free to reach out to me anytime, guys. Appreciate thanks, you. Thanks, John. Be well. God bless. Happy New Year. All right. Yeah, Take happy care. New Year, everybody. Take care. Bye, everyone. See you. See you. Bye.